welcome to our session this afternoon, Building Back Better, where we're going to be looking at some of the um, challenges that we have faced over the last year and ensuring that we future-proof ourselves so that we build back better um, <clears throat> going forward. I'm joined today by three incredible uh, speakers who I feel really privileged to have discussed this topic with me today. Um, first of all, I'm joined by Izzy Obeng, who is the founder and managing director of Foundervine, which is an inclusive startup community which develops diverse founders and entrepreneurs. Um, Izzy is a passionate campaigner for diversity in innovation, and Izzy also formerly held an enterprise advisory role within the University of London, where she managed an incubator program. So welcome, Izzy. Um, also, I'd love to welcome to, uh, to you all Kish Harani. Kish um, has over 20, uh, 20 year experience in the games industry, working at the BBC, uh, Microsoft and Sony. Uh, he is currently the uh, Chief Technology of Officer of Terra Virtua and also the Chair of BAME in, uh, BAME in Games uh, and has uh, since, and sorry, he's been the chair of Bayman Games since 2016. And in 2019, the Financial Times listed Kish uh, as one of its top 100 most influential leaders in UK tech. So, as I say, we're very lucky to have Kish with us today. Um, and last but by no means least, I'm joined by my creative, APP, creative diversity APPG uh, colleague, Dave O'Brien. Uh, who is um, the Chancellor's Fellow in Cultural and Creative Industries at the University of Edinburgh, an academic expert in social mobility and diversity in the sector. And his most recent book uh, with, um, with Drs. Orion Brooke and Mark Taylor is Culture Bad For You, uh, Inequality in the Cultural and Creative Industries. Um, and just a small plug from the Creative Diversity APPG, our report has gone out today, uh, which was the round table held by Policy and Evidence Centre and ourselves to the Creative Diversity APPG. So you can see that on all the Twitter channels and social media channels and it's worth having a read. So without further ado, I'd like to, to welcome you all. Thank you all for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all here. I'm going to just kick Hello. off. Hello. Yes, you can all talk now. You're allowed to, you're allowed to speak to me. Um, so I wanted to kick off, actually, and start with you, Dave, if that's OK. Um, <clears throat> so you have written extensively on the inequalities uh, within the creative industries. Um, <clears throat> what was the state of play in uh, the wider sector pre-pandemic, and where are we now, would you say? Yeah. Um... I'm sort of hopeful that we'll start off with all the bad news and then, uh, you know, the session will maybe start to reflect on, on some more um, positive messages. Unfortunately, um, across the creative sector, pre-pandemic, um, there was a bit of a, I guess, a pessimistic story um, about diversity. The areas I know best are um, gender, race and social class. And what we could see was a really sort of uneven story um, where some parts of the creative industries were doing well um, in terms of individual characteristics. So, for example, um, IT industry and, and IT occupations look really great in terms of their ethnic diversity. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of uh, leading the way in creative industries but they have a fairly kind of catastrophic problem um, in terms of the levels of women um, in those parts of the creative economy. Um, things like performing arts, what you tend to see are, you know, kind of not bad levels um, of gender representation, but comparatively lower levels of ethnic and racial diversity and a pretty sort of catastrophic class um, problem. We know from uh, work by some of my colleagues, Mark Taylor, for example, um, that there are particular issues around representation of disability in things like the games industry. Um, and I mean, it's great, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about games because um, they've led the way in, in, in many uh, different areas. And there are lots of complex causes uh, for these um, patterns that I've been, been mentioning. Um, some of which is to do with how you get in. So, for example, getting into film and TV can be difficult um, because you need networks. Um, it's, it's quite expensive to do training. It, it, it's particularly expensive to uh, invest in maybe, you know, your, your, your own film. 
there's a lot of expectation of things like unpaid work, whether as an internship or um, as a volunteer. And then there's these kind of, I guess, more complicated barriers, uh, which are to do with people's expectations. Uh, so, for example, in museums, you know, that there's a really obvious, and, and, and the gallery sector, there's a really obvious expectation that women um, will be coming in, um, in in really big numbers at the start of their career, but they're often not thought of as, as being, you know, the kind of the right, quote unquote, appointment for a senior curatorial position. And you see similar in the film industry when it comes to uh, high-end directors, high-end producers. Um, there is this, I guess, set of assumptions associated with gender and in other areas associated with race, class and disability. There's also, I think, and, and this is, is maybe where I'll kind of round up uh, this uh, little overview, I think there's an unfortunate attachment um, of the idea of kind of risk or risk taking to particular social groups across creative industries. Some of this is expressed um, in things like film about, you know, could you have a female lead in a superhero film um, in terms of publishing about what audiences want and what kind of um, story should be told by say British Asian authors um, and through to other areas like, like design and, and craft as well. And that association of uh, maybe, you know, commercial or curatorial risk with particular social groups, I think is, is going to be something that's really a problem post pandemic as already, you know, we're starting to see certain voices around the sector talking about, you know, the need to maybe sort of play it safe, the need to, you know, uh, address uh, audiences in a way that, you know, will guarantee whether it's bonds on seats or uh, sales or, or, or whatever. And I, I think that actually kind of the really hard to tease out and hard to, um, I guess, uncover and challenge ideas about creative risk taking um, is, is something that's going to be really important when we think about building back better. Thank you, Dave. That was a, an, an excellent um, overview. Um, and I'd like to unpick some of that um, in just a second. I just wanted to bring in Kish on this one, if that's okay, Kish. Um, it, was, it was just, with your extensive career in gaming, um, how has the situation in terms of diversity and inclusion changed over time? I mean, Dave spoke a little bit of, about that, but if you could expand, that would be brilliant. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and Dave, if uh, Mark Taylor uh, is from Sheffield uh, University, your colleague, then it's the same colleague I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in my piece uh, because he did the uh, industry census. Uh, uh, we worked with him, a uh, fantastic guy. So yeah, um, I'm going to start uh, just giving you a, a picture of the, uh, the video games industry because I think it's, it's still very uh, considered a new industry. So it, it's been around for 40 years. Uh, globally, I would say, and um, and specifically in Britain, we would say was established industry about 30 years ago. That's when we actually had a trade body which was formed in Britain. So it, it's a sort of a good way to just say it's about 30 years old, uh, credible industry as such. Now, the shocking part of that, uh, which is you'll see where it leads to uh, in terms of measuring diversity or uh, how the industry has evolved over time, we don't actually credibly know. Uh, is for the simple fact that there've never been a, a census uh, done of who works in the industry. Now, I'll, I'll just give you a bit more context, although I just, uh, and I'm sure everybody has about video games, it gets played everywhere, everybody's had about games like Fortnite and Candy Crush, etc. But for the last three years running in Britain, I'm pretty certain Europe is very similar and US is the same. Uh, the industry revenue generated has been greater than the TV, film industry, and the music industry combined. And that's been consistent. And I, 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 I'm sure that will remain consistent now just because of the amount of platforms they are available to play uh, video games now. And, you know, mobile games is probably a, a fantastic platform where it's, it's just almost uh, as soon as mobile phones came about uh, and thanks to Android and uh, iPhones, uh, the industry just, not even doubled, bigger than doubled. So uh, 
that's what's happened. Now, the shocking part is the very first credible census we did was last year. And the figures were then officially released uh, early this year. So, for example, uh, from that census, and when I say credible, it was about 20% uh, or took part in that. Prior to that, uh, creative industries and a few others have tried to give a rough estimate of who works in the video games industry. But again, it's always been, it's just video games and nobody has really paid attention to it. So we have had figures like 4% ethnic minority. And when you dig uh, a more deep into that, it was about 100 people who took part in that survey. So it means four people just said, uh, I'm ethnic minority. So it's never been credible. So that's how young we are as an industry. So moving forward, uh, and uh, tremendous thanks to Mark Taylor and Sheffield University and the, re, uh, the census, which was independently done, and the trade body, uh, Yuki, uh, who carried this out. Uh, we published it uh, earlier this year, and it's 20% uh, we know it was the ethnic minority in the video games. Uh, uh, and uh, sorry, I, I apologize, it's actually 10%. 20% is female, uh, sorry, roughly about 28% is female in the video games industry, 10% uh, ethnic minority. Now, keep in mind, this is the very first census we did. So we actually uh, promoted it. So you could have a bit of a false sort of, uh, because it was promoted, a lot of ethnic minorities, a lot of females took part in that uh, survey. So, so realistically speaking, uh, this is gonna be done every two years. So the next one will be in uh, 20, uh, 2022 when it will be published. And then the year after 2024 is actually when we'll have some core relations and figure out uh, if there's a growth, uh, what the issues are, what actually makes up the industry. So it's crazy, you know, a 40 year old industry, 30 years old for sure. And it's only going to be a four years from now when we'll actually know who's actually working in the industry where we can measure and to answer the question very confidently when you'll say, how has the industry grown? I would probably say, yes, we have data and we can tell you this is how it's grown. So right now it's very Observation wise, you know, I joined the industry, by the way, it's uh, 25 years now. So I just said 25, uh, 20 years plus. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, I'll, 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 next year, I'll say 25 years plus in the video games industry. Uh, and like any creative industry, it's very similar picture in the creative side for certain. Uh, it, it's all talent and merit based. So if you're really passionate about that industry, same with music or so, then your gender, your ethnicity, etc. doesn't really matter. If you're bold enough, you'll go apply. And the industry is incredibly welcoming on that. The issue which comes along, and it's still the case, is your parents, your mentors, your uh, teachers uh, do not consider this as a serious career. So at that point, when you're considering video games industry, and, and for that matter, you know, quite a few others, music and film and TV has similar issues or so, but we are quite uh, in that phase still where now uh, go and get a real job. So over the years, that's been the case. I was the exception. I mean, even now, 25 years, and if you'll ask my dad, uh, what, do I, what do I do for a living? Uh, he, he doesn't, he would be able to tell. Uh, yes, he'll be able to tell, oh yeah, I used to work at BBC and I was working on uh, BBC Multimedia and worked on Bob the Builder and quite a few titles. So he'll be able to say certain things like that or at Sony and so, but apart from that, it, it still has a clue what I do in the video games industry. So that's the reality in the bigger picture of um, how, everybody working in this industry is, and that stretches all the way out to the government and everybody else. Nobody actually really knows uh, how to help this industry uh, because it's such early days of data we can supply back. So it's not the, uh, the government or their fault. So I think it's all of us, we're growing and suddenly we've realized this is a credible industry. So uh, it's shocking, but I'll end with that. Yeah, it's 2020 and we've actually got the very first census of who's actually working in, in our industry, which is shocking. Thank you very much, Kish. Um, I just had a quick follow-up question, if you, if you don't yes, mind, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, before I go to Izzy, which was, um, <clears throat> what different approaches and issues, though, do you think exist um, with the different roles, if you like, in the talent strands within yeah. gaming? Yeah, so, and that's a very good question, because uh, video games industry, and like a lot of other creative industries, so almost splits into two uh,
uh, industry, sub industries within. So you've got the creative part and then you've got the business part. And the business part, I won't focus too much on because that's very similar to every other industry. So, and when I say business part, you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, accountancy and lawyers and uh, sales and marketing and those sort of disciplines. And they're fantastic. It's uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, cross pollination within other industries. People can come in and out. But the other the key part is things like programmers and artists or so that's um, it's, it actually varies quite a bit so your classic artists and programmers are have a very very almost typical path in the sense that uh, they've got a degree in programming or as artists uh, we have in fact uh, i think britain can boast to be the oldest uh, video games industry course taught at university, that's uh, Abitay University in Scotland, uh, in the world, I believe uh, it is the first one who uh, had that about more than 20 years ago. Uh, so that's a, a very, very sort of set part of how you get into the video games industry or so. And then you've got the other end, which is uh, designers, for example. A lot of majority of the designers, although their courses out there, uh, start as QA programmers. They love video games, they're passionate. So they go in and just play games and get paid for testing games and then work their way up or so. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's a very sort of odd way, but yeah, you have to be like really passionate. And it's crazy that a lot of the project managers and people are reading projects started their career in the video games industry without any qualifications as QA testers or so. And uh, so that's, again, very separate. And then you've got things like audio, QA, localization, I mentioned QA, and that's had very different sort of sets of, uh, and let me focus a bit more, so elaborate on localization. That's the classic one where you get the ethnic minorities uh, who are sort of uh, prevalent uh, purely because of language, one. And again, female, uh, it's very odd. So from the census, we saw uh, that Britain actually has more ethnic minority female in the video games industry which is shocking. Uh, but when you look a bit at uh, the sample size is very small. When we looked a bit more on that, all of them were uh, immigrants. They came into Britain. They weren't actually born in Britain. And that was something which came out of the census. Sample size was very tiny, but uh, you know, this sort of figures we wouldn't know until about four years from now on who's actually making the industry, what's happening uh, in terms of where we can help out. Or so by looking at credible data. So yes, I, I hope, I think that covered most of the discipline. I do apologize. Uh, and maybe I will add, which I, I know it's another complete separate topic, but equally uh, credible and we should recognize as part of the industry is the vloggers, uh, people who get on YouTubes and who just uh, sit around and set up a career. And in fact, they're probably earning more than all of us uh, combined here just by uh, talking about video games uh, from their bedrooms uh, and then esports. And those two are a credible, which have sort of uh, come into the industry almost. Uh, nobody actually considers that as part of video games industry, but they are the ones who are the best evangelists you can ever get as from the video games industry. Thank you, Kish. Thank you. That was so in depth and really, really, really um, great for us to use, uh, certainly for the backdrop of the, the rest of the conversation. So thank you very much. Um, Izzy, um, I just wanted to ask you if that's, if that's okay. Um, so beyond the large corporate, sorry, beyond large organisations, you you work with a number of founders and innovators that are at the early stage. Um, what is the reality in terms of the diversity amongst this cohort? Yeah, so it's it's a really it's a really interesting time, I think, to be a founder or an innovator from a diverse background. In that, um, we've been having a lot of conversations about. Um, what support for entrepreneurs and creatives looks like, particularly um, in light of COVID-19, where so many of the uh, traditional um, uh, roles that creative takes, for example, Dave mentioned film and TV and the impact COVID has had on the industry has been huge. And um, from, um, you know, more of the sort of tech and digital side of things, the industry has also been impacted as well in terms of the um the access that non-traditional diverse talent have to a lot of these industries and um what we found is that covid threw a curveball in and we all kind of scrambling around as people who kind of work in the ecosystem and support building the pipeline to make sure that we put the infrastructure in place for people to still get the opportunities and then we had 
Black Lives Matter happen um, and this renewed conversation about race in the workplace, um, race in the education system and investment, all of those things happen and renewed what had been quite a stagnant conversation about diversity where um, it was kind of overly centred on gender diversity and the conversation on that had progressed um, quite significantly but people were just a little bit uncomfortable when it, talk, when it came to talking about um, race diversity and um, specifically uh, the opportunities available in terms of career progression, in terms of um, running businesses, raising investment for um, black professionals um, in particular and it kind of all, all got lumped into this um, EAME kind of um, uh, thing which was kind of such a range of um, diversities within it that it became difficult to have a straight conversation about the problem that we had and what we do. And so we find that a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators in our network are kind of tired about having the conversations about the systemic challenges we have um, in, an, in industries where it's really, really hard to get the kind of entry level roles you need to get experience. It's really, really hard to get to the top and get the kind of senior level experience you need to get to either branch off and do your own thing or to be a kind of leader or the kind of um, most senior person within whatever organization you're part of. It's also really hard to raise the kind of investment that you need to. And the number of times I speak to entrepreneurs who, um, you know, say all the time that, you know, you go in for investment, what you get is advice. Um, and there's kind of a lot of, there's always been um, an additional challenge that for multiple reasons, you know, it's an investment industry um, where there are a lot of people who come from very similar backgrounds. Um, and then you've got uh, people who are coming in with ideas for businesses or for new ventures that are just a bit less familiar to people from the mainstream. So you face that challenge. And I recently found out that um, of the of all of the venture capital funding that's been given out um, over the last 10 years, the last decade, only 38 black founders had received venture capital funding. I thought it was a typo when I first saw that, but there's some great research that's coming out recently that shows that there are systemic and structural issues when it comes to um, people from diverse backgrounds who want to not only start out in industry, but who want to start the kinds of businesses that we need um, to grow the future of our economy. And so um, I feel like I talk about this all the time, so it's, it gets quite tired and we can talk about the problems all day. But often what I find is that we talk about the challenges in terms of the problems that individual founders face, you know, so, you know, it's really hard getting in the door, all of these things, but we often don't talk about the challenges in the industry which often go unaddressed, which don't allow um, these individuals to get the opportunities that they need. We don't look at the, um, the cultures and the practices and the procedures and the how we do things around here that make it quite difficult for people who have great ideas, who may not come from that university or who may not come from that part um, of the UK and who just want a foot in the door. So what I'm hearing over and over again, just to sum all of that up, is that there needs to be more investment in terms of funding creative ventures, in terms of funding digital ventures, there needs to be more opportunities to gain entry level experience, particularly in a digital environment where we are less hampered by physical location. You don't have to come to London all the time now. So we can look into what remote internship opportunities like for the entire country. Um, and also finding more opportunities to get that kind of mentorship and knowledge and advice building, you know, meeting stakeholders, building warm relationships with people often the difference between a successful career and not because as we know the vast majority of jobs aren't advertised so we need a lot more and a, a very honest conversation at all levels of the organizations that we're part of about how we provide those kinds of opportunities and stop talking about just how bad the situation is but actually commit to longer term structured opportunities multi-year not just flash in the pans three months really public things but really long-term opportunities to build the pipeline of talent in entrepreneurship, in creative, in digital. Brilliant, thank you, Izzy. I mean, I, th I think you touched on so many points there and I think you're brilliant because you, you rounded that up with all of the practical things actually that could start to happen. But I always wonder when we have these conversations about things like this, that there's, there's lots of work that then goes into uh, the individuals who are 
being othered or who are not um, being given the opportunities. You know, they they may get coached or they may get mentored or, you know, and we, we create and we almost sort of put all the support around those individuals who have the skills and the talents, but actually are not being met with the opportunities at times. And I wonder what your view is on what we might need to say to investors, uh, to venture capitalists about the way that you some of the uh, businesses that you're you're talking about, because it was something that uh, Brenda touched on this morning in her keynote that you know there are some biases that come out in in the industry, which which may speak to the fact that you know if you are a black person, you're more likely to have poor credit, and therefore that impacts then on um, you know how you're viewed. And I just wonder where you're talking about venture capitalism. If there is something about um, educating the the investors. On, on challenging the way that they view the businesses that are owned or the ideas that are owned by the people that you're speaking about? Yeah, it's, it's such a kind of big, um, a big question about the state of venture capital and there are lots of different angles to it. On one level, um, we talk about an industry that is by its very nature made up of people who overwhelmingly kind of like just completely over-index from very specific backgrounds, you know, private school, um, you know, Oxbridge, and um, because of the nature of getting into it, you, you kind of have to have a certain kind of network to get into it. Um, you have to have a certain kind of background and interests growing up to kind of get into it. And then when it comes to um, the diversity at decision-making roles within VCs, it's dire. Um, uh, recently, um, a group of uh, black venture, uh, black people who work in venture came together and they found of the sort of 1,000 or so decision-making people within VCs in the UK, only about 10 to 25 of them were black. And so you've got a situation in which there are people who do not fully understand the lived experiences of di diverse founders. And you, I talk about race, but the gender situation isn't too great either. Um, and in terms of class, um, but you've got people who just fundamentally don't fully understand it. And um, the, as I said, the founders that kind of come to me and we talk about some of the, just some of the comments that you get, it reveals that we have a big challenge around unconscious bias as well and conscious biases. But um, I, I don't think it would be rev a revelationary thing for me to say that I think that all VCs should take some unconscious bias training because um, there are different markets and you know just really small examples so i'm based um in ghana and west africa and i often speak to founders who are raising money in america and europe and um one founder actually said to me that um a vc implied that he would use the money for his own personal needs almost reminded him that the money wasn't for him it was for the business and that kind of assumption that you know you may be kind of in need and be a kind of subsistence entrepreneur so won't use the money in the same way or there are lots of assumptions that are built up over time because of the stereotypes that we have around different groups of people and if those aren't challenged it leads to decisions that aren't in the best interest of everyone and if you think about it the kind of long-term impact is that you're just kind of sleeping on huge potential opportunities so it's to your financial benefit to actually broaden your perspective about the businesses to invest in um, but still it's very kind of closed cohort of people who all invest in kind of similar kind of cohorts of people um, and I'm seeing some amazing work um, just to change that I look at um, platforms like 10 by 10 platforms like Ada Ventures who just raised 30 million fund for female founders and we're seeing this increasingly but we're not going to see the change that we want to see unless VCs are willing to publish the data um, about their diverse, um, uh, the companies they've invested in, to have really honest conversations at the highest levels um, about what they need to do to create more office hours for um, diverse founders as well, because we know that you're 10 times more likely to raise investment if you have a warm introduction. You're only going to get a warm introduction if your mate can introduce you or your uncle. So we need to have more conversations about how we increase access as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Izzy. Um, and this question really is to, to all of you. Um, obviously, we are in unprecedented times. Um, what do you think that the, the uh, pandemic, what impact is that having on just generally the industry's commitment to diversity and inclusion? If I could come to you, Dave, just if you have any observations on that. Um, I mean, I, I'd echo... Um, 
everything is Izzy had said. You know, th this isn't just um, a VC um, and you know new ventures investment issue, but exactly uh, what you've been outlining, Izzy, is how the film industry works. It's you know a really kind of common set of problems that come up in publishing. It's certainly a major uh, issue for the contemporary art world. Um, and in, in a slightly kind of different variation, you, you see it in theatre and performing arts uh, really clearly as well. Um, and the point you'd made about the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and, and, and moments is, is really crucial as well, because in some ways, say, for example, in, in television, the impact of the pandemic might be a moment for hope um, because the uh, intersection of the Black Lives Matter movement and the awareness, I guess, of um, the way people have turned to television and, and, and streaming platforms has focused organisations like the BBC, Channel 4, ITV and Sky on doing, you know, much more kind of direct and targeted commissions because they know they're not uh, serving um, all of the, the British population kind of fairly and, and evenly and they know they've got a long way to go in terms of represent, representation, both uh, in terms of writing, in, in terms of behind the camera and, and obviously on screen um, and thematically as well. But I suppose the issue is, is that these kind of moments of hope are set against the impact of a pandemic that um, has, you know, devastated some industries like anything that involves an audience such as performing the arts or, or live music has essentially had you know a full year of activity removed and this raises questions for the sustainability of people who are in the middle of their careers the sustainability of organizations that are there you know either as businesses or as publicly funded organizations to support uh, put on de develop creative practice but it also uh, raises a profound question for people who are just getting in um, and i think there's there's a real worry that if you take away, um, you know, the, the kind of crucial moments of, say, an Edinburgh festival for comedians and theatre makers, um, a series of kind of, you know, online now, but not physical uh, games, trading events, um, you know, those kind of moments that might be important to someone getting a first radio commission. Um, are those people able to kind of hold off for a year? Uh, and maybe, you know, kind of come back next year and, and, and hopefully plug back in? Or actually, are we seeing, you know, effectively a kind of a, a cohort just being removed from that early career moment? And it's unfortunate that, you know, it's taken a, a pandemic um, and the Black Lives Matter movement to kind of focus minds in terms of race and television. But, you know, the, the worry is, is that, um, what should be happening is that, you know, a similar focus should be coming up with regard to gender, with regard to disability, with regard to things like social class origins. And yet, you, you know, the kind of the infrastructure of whether it's senior people, middle career people, institutions are all going to be, you know, again, I, I mentioned this, they're going to have this version of risk aversion, uh, which again, as, as Izzy was saying, you know, that sense of not quite knowing beyond what they know already and not being willing to do to do things differently which is absolutely what's needed at this moment um thank, thank you thank you dave um and um if i could come to you um kish it was just about um a, a, if you could talk a little bit on the same subject really but with a with a bit of focus around the um r d and and innovation and how do we make sure that inequalities are not just exact as I can never say this word. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean. <laughs> Did you say yeah, it on I'm behalf sorry. of everybody else? I don't know why that word can't come out. <laughs> Exacerbated. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. So, um, and and I, uh, yeah, uh, before going too positive, and uh, I, I want to play the good cop, I guess, over here, if Dave wants, but I, I fully agree with what Dave's saying. And it's actually, and, and 
uh, probably individuals like me need to be very careful because you're quite sort of uh, optimistic and positive and uh, especially video games industry. Uh, I, I speak to so many developers, publishers, oh, we're fine, we're digitally forward. We, we already got our staff ready because everybody was ready to work from home, et cetera, which is great, but it just means uh, echoing out to the rest of the world, uh, you're then ignored. Uh, and what happens year after or so, so you're constantly sort of, it's, it's, uh, it's the classic sort of uh, uh, duck in a pond, you're paddling crazy to stay afloat, but everybody thinks everything is fine. And that's a big fear in the video games industry for certain. I think a lot of creative industry, which just say they're fine this year. Now, having said that, uh, and your, more to your question in R&D or so, uh, it's been quite fantastic diversity wise purely because it means you can uh, geography of the world is no longer an issue whatsoever you can hire the talent across from the world uh, or outset uh, rather than hire uh, i think contract is probably a better word this year because everybody it's too uncertain uh, and that's a big issue as well again will that continue next year but let's stay on the positive you're getting some amazing diverse talent uh, who can work from anywhere uh, in the world or so we've seen that a lot especially in the video games industry uh, especially in the r d sectors or so and uh, what's happened a lot, uh, and I'll give you a, a good example of Bamin Games. Uh, we completely changed our format. So Bamin Games is a monthly meetup. The whole idea of our monthly meetup is go and physically visit a studio where you could possibly work at. Uh, and it's all ethnic minorities who meet up. And most of our meet, as you would have expected or probably guessed, would be in and around London because it's just so much easier. And suddenly COVID came along and the biggest selling point of Bamin Games, getting ethnic minorities to go and visit amazing development studios, uh, learn how they work on the other end, the studios can show off, look, we want our stuff, that changed. So we went online, Bamin Games virtual. Now, suddenly the rest of the world could dial in and even just taking Britain, there were so many areas within Britain and there's so many amazing talent and studio and R&D companies across, they started dialing in they approached us and said, we would like to host one of these sessions, which we have done that. And that's been fantastic. And we have promised everyone that we will continue. Once this world is a different world next year, let's hope uh, we can all physically meet. So we will not stop on the virtual meets because it's made the world a lot more uh, smaller in that sense. So uh, yes, I think it's, it's been quite positive for us from that and uh, we've managed to reach the world all across. Uh, I mean, uh, on a personal end as well, I've spoken at two conferences in Africa in, in the last three weeks actually. There's one in South Africa and then the next one was in Kenya. Uh, yeah, the South Africa one was scheduled. Uh, they were going to fly me in. Uh, but the Kenya one, they wouldn't have been able to afford speakers from Britain, Europe, everywhere else. So, and vice versa, you know, I, I really, and we're working really hard to make sure those speakers uh, are on the podium in Britain and in conferences all across the world as well. So, yes, uh, early days and I, I'm very, very, uh, sort of optimistic that, and it requires people like us to make sure that continues. Thank you, Kish. Izzy, what do you think? What do you think also, um, yeah, what, what do you think will reduce the, the level of inequalities rather than sort of supercharge them, you know, once we come back out of if we, whatever that new normal look, looks like? Yeah, so I think the I remember in June when everything was kind of kicking off and we had all those processes. I kept saying to myself, don't ask me um, what I think yet because everything's a bit too early. You know, there's a lot of like performative solidarity. We all remember the black squares. Um, and I was just saying to myself like, oh gosh. Um, and, you know, we, we, we host an event um, just yesterday where um, over 120 people joined to have a conversation about whether this was the moment Britain actually changed and what, what it actually means for the future of our economy. And it, the consensus um, that we had was that we're seeing, we're seeing the signs. I think that organisations are, they are trying, they're trying. And in many ways that is better than before. 
in which I think the conversation either, like I said, got wrapped up in a wider conversation and therefore lost, um, or it was kind of ha um, handled in um, a way that didn't fully include the people it needed to include. And so now I'm seeing a situation in which organizations who um, are serious um, about you know, diversifying the industry are serious about showing the communities that they speak to that they are mission driven and that they genuinely care. Um, they are putting in place longer, multi-year um, commitments towards diversity. Um, but I think we need to keep an eye on all of them. Um, so it's one thing releasing a diversity statement. It's one thing doing a very high profile thing and creating a board where you've got some person who's super senior in industry to chair it and everything. Um, but it's another thing making sure that people at all levels of the organization that you are part of and the communities you surround are included in that journey and feel like something is materially changing um, in their world. I think when we when we talk about the, um, the creative and digital sectors, um, so I, I spent 18 months working in higher education and I'm deeply passionate about students leaving university, school, college, with opportunities you know just at this point with opportunities with hope for a future and we just need to make a commitment as people who work in industry as institutions who whose work guides the future of where industry is going that we're going to support them in getting there so um opportunities to get more interns in a lot more representation at the top and not tokenistic gestures um like just bringing on one person, um, but just real kind of opportunities for sponsorship of people who are going into senior leadership, um, mentorship, changing the culture so people feel more included and see themselves represented at the top, all that good stuff. Um, and on top of that, companies actually are looking at their supply chain as well. Like, are you procuring from organizations that represent society? Are you, are you finding diverse businesses to um to to buy products or services from i think there's a big piece that's not happening there I and mean, we won't see the kind of change we want to see unless we have that we've already talked a bit about investment but there's so much that needs to happen there and so i think just to long story short is this the moment that britain changes i don't know i think the jury's still out on that one but i'm seeing the kinds of things and hearing the kind of noises that I think that I need to hear to know that this is a significant step on a very long journey that we all need to be on. Thank you, Izzy. Um, Dave, i just come to you and um, time's flown by, so probably have to be my last question for all of you, but um, it was just, and obviously with the work that you do, Dave, for our sort of creative industries to be more inclusive, for future innovative, innovators, sorry, uh, we need cooperation from, from industry and from the government. And I just wondered if you might suggest what policymakers can do to support the effort. Yeah, um, because we're running out of time, uh, you know, normally I'd suggest like lots of different strategies and but actually just money. Um, I, I think we're, we're at the point now where given, you know, what's been happening to freelancers from across creative uh, professions, you know, given uh, again, you know, Izzy was just saying about school leavers, they're about to enter, you know, pretty much the worst employment market for, you know, at least 40 years, but possibly hundreds of years. Money, you know, th throw money at the problem. Um, and it's worth remembering that part of the story of the creative industries in Britain, um, the reason, you know, they've been so attractive, the reason we might argue that the HRC is putting so much money in, the reason we're having these conversations is a story that there are huge amounts uh, of money to be made somewhere in the creative industries. And so why can't we use some of that to support people um, who you know, either need that kind of uh, support year to year to get over the pandemic or need that support in terms of developing their careers? Thank you, Dave. Um, Izzy, if I can come back to you, if that's okay. What was the question there? <laughs> <laughs> How do we um, encourage the efforts of sort of policy makers to support so policy makers to support the efforts of creatives in, and the industry? Yeah. So um, again, I could say a million things, but to keep it really brief, 
Um, we need to massively increase the quality of the data we have on people from diverse backgrounds in this country. You will be shocked at how difficult research companies find it to pull people from harder to reach communities. And so, um, like you said in the beginning, Kish, you, you only have like a sample size of 10 or so and you're making these sweeping statements about them. That happens over and over again. We don't know enough about this. And there's a piece that, of work that needs to happen just on data. Um, I think beyond that, um, it's so important that government um, and, you know, government sees itself as more of a convening body. You know, they don't do anything, but they help things happen. And so there is this piece about how they can bring diverse institutions together to solve some of these challenges. How can you bring the banking sector together to just really look at um, how they're using their corporate responsibility? You know, what is their targets? How can they actually make it make sense? Um, bringing the educational institutions together. You've got a difference in um, universities like Cambridge who have billions of pounds in endowments from alumni and then universities like Queen Mary who get you know, 380 million, just a lot less and who have significant BAME student populations. And so universities are a big one, but, um, and also just money. <laughs> I'm gonna second Dave on that one, just more money startup loans, um, grants to creative industries, working really closely with industry and grant providers to just put more money in the ecosystem, start to fill those gaps and help these organizations build back better. Thank you very much, Izzy. And Kish, if you could do your answer to, your answer to that question in maybe like one minute, that would be yeah, let's, that, That's gonna to be tough. I wanted to answer two part as well. But yeah, let's get the money out of the way, absolutely. Uh, uh, very, very shortly in terms of government and policies or so, have a diverse team, have, I, I, I doubt they've got any representative of, from the video games industry. Again, the industry which shouts louder gets the more money is sort of the approach right now. Absolutely fantastic. I fully understand why the travel industry, quite a few other industries, money being thrown at it or so. But this is the big, big issue that people who are not speaking out are then left away. And then the problem just comes up further down the line or so. So that I think it's a big, big issue uh, that uh, money is not being distributed uh, to those who are not shouting. Uh, and so, so secondly, I, this is more, I think, a, a lot of scouted by everybody else, but it's quite sort of dear to me also, which I think it's such a big, big issue is apprenticeship. Now, uh, and give you, a, so the mayor of London runs an absolute fantastic program. If you've not read about it, I'll, I'll send a link later on. It's called WIN Workforce Integration Network. Uh, I think that's what it stands for. Uh, but it basically, very, very sh uh, shortly uh, uh, describe it. It's aimed at 16 to 25 year old black man because unemployment and crime rate and quite a few other issues. So uh, within London, uh, that's quite a high number in that sort of demography. Now, uh, I had the privilege to address a lot of that audience. So what I did is just, a, I just need a live poll to this amazing, fantastic young male individuals. And I had stated every single uh, uh, sector there is uh, where the uh, recognized in Britain. So you've got agriculture, mechanical, uh, uh, constructions, and uh, quite a few other accounts, name it, everything was there. And so I put creative industry as well. I did put video games industry. And I just literally said, what industry would you like to work in? And we had like about 50 individuals in the audience. Guess what everybody said? 80% said they want to work in the creative industry. How much apprenticeship do we have in the creative industry? Probably very, very tiny. None in the video games industry. You don't get that. And these are the jobs of the future. And unfortunately, a lot of apprenticeships, things like, you know, especially mechanics, constructions, uh, apprenticeship being given to these young, amazing individuals to jobs which uh, unlikely they are going to have any job satisfaction. They're going to do it because it's a job, but it's not going to train them for life, for that skill, for their talent as well or so. And I'll just end on that, that the apprenticeship needs to really change and focus on creative industry and get those young people to do something what they really want to do as opposed to forced into an industry, which is just a job today. And then they probably in harder times struggling for finding another role or so. So I'll end at that. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for being so brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you all and hearing all your absolutely valuable um, advice and observations on building back better. Um, so just very quickly, some key takeaways. We need a lot more money in the industry to support. Uh, we need to be challenging bias. 
uh, a lot more at, at multiple stages, uh, really um, making our data collection, collection much more sophisticated so that we can address um, these challenges head on with evidence and also just take a little bit more advantage of the apprenticeships option, uh, just some of the four, just four, four of the things that I've picked up um, today. So thank you to all of you. Um, so that's the end of this session, but only for a little while. If you go into the uh, session space, uh, you will see Dave, Izzy and um, Kish, where they'll be able to have the live Q&A with you. So if you have more questions, please do join them over in the session space. Uh, next session is Deep Dive Frame Rate, um, which has actually been recorded using Light Smart's um, stage technology um, to provide a novel way of doing this. So the session takes an in-depth look at frame rate, which is created from thousands of daily 3D scans and hundreds of billions of precisely measured points. Uh, the work observes change a spatial and temporal scale uh, impossible to see with a human eye or a lens of traditional cameras. Um, so please do take a look and, and join Deep Dive Frame Rate and of course uh, join uh, my fellow uh, colleagues here in the session space. Uh, we are live indeed, uh, Anna tells me. Um, and Anna's thrown quite, quite a useful um, question from the audience, Adams. Uh, which I guess is is, is for you, Kish, because um, yeah. you, you were talking about it, and I, I might be able to say a couple of things mm -hmm. as well, which is about apprenticeships. Yes. Um, and basically, like, could you say a bit more about what's working and, and what isn't, and maybe what, what the kind of uh, the unique problems of creative industries are? Yeah. Uh, the, the big issue we have is there's just no infrastructure at all in terms of apprenticeship. Uh, for example, apprenticeship in... Uh, mechanics, you know, car repairing cars or so, that industry has been established and apprenticeship programs have been running for the last uh, God knows how long or so. And there isn't one, I mean, and I could definitely speak on behalf of video games industry, but I'm sure a lot of other sectors are very, very similar. And there's no formal apprenticeship programs at all whatsoever, which means it's so difficult. And we are such in early days, I mean, video games industry itself will also be a bit resistant because again, uh, you're working on projects. We are very, very secretive. Why are you going to get in somebody who's just an apprentice or so? And all that sort of journey needs to happen. We need to start somewhere. And that's, we, we not even started any of that at all, especially in the video games industry, but I'm sure you might, you will echo uh, that a lot of other sectors, it is very, very similar. Uh, there's just, just no formal programs at all out there. Anything as far as in our industry, it's, it's, it's companies who are setting up their own programs to provide apprenticeship. Uh, and I'll use this word out, out of the goodness of their heart, they, you know, to just, uh, bring a sort of more diverse young talent in. And I also, uh, before you continue, uh, I'll use the word, and it's always young. It, I don't, this is uh, especially creative industry, such a fantastic industry. Ed should not be a matter uh, when it comes to apprenticeship. Uh, I, I, I really hope because it's a newer industry, we're starting from scratch. We address that factor as well, rather than just copy what's been historically the case. And I guess, you know, like, just taking car mechanics and apprenticeship or construction, it's always damn with younger uh, individuals or so. Uh, let's hope when it's formalized or so, we actually open that up and it shouldn't be a matter to actually have formal apprenticeship in the video games industry or any other creative sector whatsoever. Yeah, and I'd, I'd probably add to that business structures as well. So uh, the way the government's program is at the moment, I think, a bit like you were mentioning, you know, things like the car industry, there is a sort of a vision of, you know, you've got this organization, you can go there for a set number of weeks, they do the same thing kind of every day, rather than thinking about industries where there might be an incredible amount of work to do for two weeks uh, at the crunch point of a project. And then, you know, the team might get smaller for two months or, you know, these kind of things. And that's true, like outside of games, it's very true of film, uh, it's true of things like uh, theatre as well. Um, there's an interesting question uh, that's come through um, about investors not being in the room when conversations about diversity are going on. Uh, and again, you know, both Kish and I can talk to that, but but it strikes me that Izzy, you're 
uh, the real expert on this. So, so how, how can we kind of change that? And how can we get investors in, into the rooms to have you know, the right kind of conversations? Yeah, it's, uh, so one of the things that I mentioned in the other session was the um, how difficult access is, just kind of finding who the right people are. And so much of um, the industry is kind of built on this um, still old boys network and it's so based on kind of um, personal introductions and and it makes perfect sense why it's based on personal introductions and that you trust people that you know um, and so they're often it's often the most sensible way to make decisions to have people introduce you to other people um, so what we need to do is rather than kind of getting rid of that system it's actually just to broaden um, the community of people who know each other and providing access for people who are from less obvious backgrounds to that as well. And so there are artificial ways, let's say, to kind of create those um, those institutions. And I mentioned kind of office hours being one of those things. And um, there are downsides to office hours in that if you've only got quite a short amount of time, it's it's limited in terms of how much you can do to get to know each other. But they are the first step. Um, and so having virtual office hours in the environment we're in where investors literally just sit down in a virtual room and have you know five or six um, entrepreneurs or creatives come to them and just pitch their idea. Um, often that can be a gateway into something else. And so that's one of the ways. I think beyond that, I think there are quite a lot of um, opportunities to just involve investors in the process of um, entrepreneurs kind of starting up and raising investment. Um, we're currently running a three month program at Barclays, for example, where we've got 25 um, black founder led businesses going through the process of building their investment readiness. And, you know, having a partner like Barclays means that they are able to just build really robust um, organizations, operationally sound, financially sound. And then they have access to all of the investors that we kind of set up office hours with and Barclays networks in terms of stakeholder connections and potential procurement opportunities as well kind of way of artificially creating those introductions and it's a huge part of our work at Vine to do that and brilliant organizations doing that all over the place so we were talking about money in the other session but more money into the infrastructure that supports the broadening of those communities as well just to follow up on that what one of the questions is about changing the perception that careers in the creative industries are not sort of serious and encouraging a broader range of people and, and again I'll, I'll, I'll come to you shortly on this Kish because this is you know an issue that's long been and you raised it uh, about computer games and indeed in, in your own experience but I wonder is he could, could you speak to the idea of like how you could I, I suppose create the sense of someone could be a founder they could be an entrepreneur that you know creating a company with a view that you'll scale it up to the point where you can move it on so you can create another company. How, how can you sort of, how can you train uh, entrepreneurs and, and what would be a way to almost kind of, you know, before the moment of needing to get in the room and before the moment mm -hmm. of working with Barclays, is there anything you, you can point to in terms of interventions before that? Yeah, so there's kind of two main things that, um, we often find um, in our work and it's you know when you're supporting kind of founders from diverse backgrounds representation and confidence um, we make a really big point of making sure that um, pretty much nearly all of the entrepreneurs or the speakers and facilitators that come in are representative of, uh, representative of the communities we serve um, and also that we actually build in time for some of those kind of soft skill community building networking activities and you know, I say representation because you can only really be what you can see. And we've all been in those situations when we were kind of coming up and we saw someone who was at the top of whatever industry we're in. And we thought, OK, we can do that. But if you can't see that, now I started my career in um, management consulting, for example. Um, I think there was like, uh, I don't know, like 600 or so partners across the UK. And only one of them is, I think, to this day, black in the firm I was working for. And how do, how do you actually see yourself if that's that's what it looks like at the top? And um, um, you look at kind of Lewis Hamilton is in the news at the moment, for example, and that he set up this commission um, that, uh, that I'm part of looking into um, diversity in motorsport. And the feedback coming from the case studies is that there was literally no one else. <laughs> um, and so it's very difficult if you're coming up to see um, to see what your future could look like. 
And then beyond that, in terms of building that network, we all know what it's like to kind of be completely outside of your comfort zone if you're in a room full of people that you that you just don't connect with or don't come from your background. So how do we broaden that confidence? How do we broaden that network for young people? We create more opportunities to gather, more opportunities to connect, more opportunities to see. And that's the way we do that at the beginning. And I think the amount of coaching and mentoring and support we can do on that journey means that we can really build that pipeline way before someone says at the end of that, oh, I might have an idea for a business and I want to take that further. That's the bit of work that I'm quite interested in. Kish, mm-hmm. you know, the, the computer games in, industry, if, if I might be so bold, you know, you and I are old enough to have watched it in real time move from stories about, you know, a couple of men, usually men, but, you know, some women as well, who are working, you know, in their bedrooms on really, you know, bespoke projects to a point where we've got, you know, large bits of Edinburgh are, you know, devoted to uh, these, you know, huge multinational corporations. And and I guess, you you know, are we still at a point where you have to kind of say to people's parents or, you know, catch someone who's maybe leaving a, uh, a graphic design course at 21 and say, this is a, you know, a proper job. Um, or do, do you think that battle has been won now? No, I, I, nowhere close to be won at all whatsoever. Uh, it, it's a very interesting industry, especially video games industry in terms of uh, the core video games industry. I mean, uh, that uh, we are in that stage of where you would have called the film industry or the rock and roll, the music industry, where if something went wrong, then blame it on rock and roll, blame it on the films they were watching or so. And video games industry for the last decade for sure or so has been, right, um, they were playing violent video games and then this happened uh, and nobody wants to tackle the bigger problem of that. There's something wrong with that individual uh, and there are millions and that's a tiny, tiny, less than 1% individuals who just do that. Uh, and then you would have thought that, okay, the pattern as it follows, uh, with social media coming along, video games industry will have a break and evolve into the, it's a normal industry, it's the social media which is causing all those issues. But with such an amazing industry, we integrated social media inside the games. So suddenly we have inherited uh, something which would have had a sort of get out of jail card free. So perception wise, I think this is going to be a, a long while. Uh, but having said that, uh, your mobile phones, uh, quite a few games consoles, making games more accessible is the best uh, advertisement the industry gets. So you've got parents, uh, people who never want to be ever called uh, that they're gamers, are playing Candy Crush on their phone. They're sitting around and just playing video games. And uh, uh, they don't want to use the word that uh, uh, they're, they're gaming. And they shouldn't. Because if you remember, uh, uh, you know, probably maybe 90s even, it was cool to write on your CV. You are a movie goer as your hobby. And that used to be considered like, that's very good. Uh, and nobody cares now. If you, you know, I mean, we don't even use the term movie goer anymore or a TV watcher if there ever was that term. Or maybe theater goer has come back again or something. But, you know, the, the video gamer term as well you know it, it, it it's soon going to be going out because everybody's playing it's part of uh and part of life uh, uh and i think that's going to help and change uh especially your parents your mentors your uh teachers whoever else uh, at a certain key stage are the main influences to deciding what industry you're going to join or so and also, although the industry, again, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of revenues, uh, bigger than TV, music, film combined or so, all of that revenue is actually right at the top end of it or so. You know, you're looking at the big, big industry. And I'll, I'll, because you mentioned Scotland, uh, Edinburgh for that matter, and Dundee and that. Actually, I started my career uh, in, uh, in Dundee in the video games uh, industry 25 years ago. So uh, not... If you ask anybody, uh, the bulk of technology, I was at Sony and we used to help them out. Uh, Grand Theft Auto, Rockstar North is based in Edinburgh. A lot of the bigger chunk of development for Rockstar, the the biggest revenue-wise selling game in the world right now, amongst the biggest, is actually developed in Britain. 
unfortunately, because of the perception of that particular game, uh, you know, it's Grand Theft Auto, which is still cars. Uh, it's difficult to publicize that as that is a British, made in British product. Although, yes, it, it is quite an international development, but bulk of that development, and, uh, you know, I had the privilege of helping that those teams out when we were at Sony on PlayStation 4 and optimizing those uh, titles or so. That was all done in Britain. And we'll never hear those stories, unfortunately, yet. Uh, so more of that needs to come out on how amazing we are. And maybe just one more, because given the chance on how amazing we are in Britain or so, a lot of PlayStation retail, retail although it's, it's no longer uh, available as such, and it's not that successful or so, but all of that technologies, arms, a lot of the processes which goes on your mobile phone, they're developed in Britain. And we need to sing and dance about all this, just the way uh, Silicon Valley and Seattle and uh, you know your Microsofts and Facebook startups do that. Uh, I think we, we just don't do enough of it in Britain at all on that. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Um, and I've got lots of my own uh, examples I, I could raise for that. But I'm, I'm conscious that we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, and, and Andrada has, has raised this interesting uh, question about um, how we might change job adverts, job posting, you know, so they're less kind of like, do you have, say, a degree or, or, or whatever, um, and, and to encourage a diverse range of candidates. I, I'm interested in, in your personal experience on this. And I guess, you know, both of you uh, must have been in a position where you've, you know, been, been thinking about building teams or, you know, been, been hiring. And I wonder if you, if you could talk a little bit uh, about your personal experience of, uh, of this, you know, Obviously, there's lots of general things like competence-based um, adverts and, and interviews, including the salary, you, you know, all of these kind of things. But, but just it'd be interesting to hear personal reflections on, on how you do you do hiring. So, so maybe, Izzy, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure. So um, so we've hired in for eight roles in the last um, six months or so. So um, a lot of work kind of went into our make sure as fair as possible but also included um, as many of our team members as possible so kind of broadly speaking what that looks like was that um, initial kind of sifting process and then um, the shortlisted long-listed candidates would be interviewed by junior members of our team and then they would decide who they wanted to work with and then they would have a senior um, a director level interview and then we would make a decision and there was also a written exercise at that stage. So we, we were assessing much more about that rapport and that ability to kind of engage and communicate and then testing competence through written exercises. Um, and what we what we found was that, you know, I think it's, it's very difficult recruiting in because you kind of know what you need as an organization and there are kind of set things that need to happen and certain qualifications are useful. There's absolutely no excuse um, to look beyond um, look beyond the obvious when it comes to potential candidates and I think written exercises are such a great way to do that because it's judging you based on what you do in that moment rather than what you say you can do um, and there are so many biases at play when we are looking at where people went to university for example and that kind of thing um, and so at that earlier stage job postings we do a lot to make sure that our um, our job adverts are gender neutral um, that they generally don't imply that you have to have a particular educational background um, and that is really clear you know we put that diversity statement up front this is the kind of organization we are these are our values this is the culture that we believe in if you think you're right for that then absolutely apply um, and we found that we've had just such a brilliant range of um, candidates and especially in these times we've had candidates who wouldn't have applied <laughs> for the kinds of roles we're offering pre-pandemic and um it's given us the opportunity to kind of really engage with people who have very different work and professional experiences, but that can be kind of applied in the context that we work in, which is maybe a little bit more niche. Um, but yeah, so I found so, so just really thinking about the language used in job candidates, really putting your culture forward before anything on job postings and making sure the full recruitment process involves people at every level of the organization as well internally. Absolutely. That's really you saw really interesting. Yeah. I, um, I'm going to answer this more from Bayman Games because we've had experience a lot with working with so many different companies all across Britain. Uh, and so first, at a very, very simple no-brainer, get rid of bullet point job descriptions. 
just must have ideal candidate bullet points or so typically what happens when you have that and it's a lot of research has been done on this uh, as soon as you do that the minority will look at it and say oh i can do five of those but uh, the other five i'm not good at and they won't apply uh, and whereas in your typical male I include myself in it as well. Uh, I, I, I've never thought as a minority in my head, uh, and luckily majority don't, uh, you, you would apply for those, but a typical male will apply for those roles. Uh, I can do five of those. I can maybe do the two others and the three others. I'll wing it and let's go for the interview. And that's what happens when you put a bullet point uh, must have. So uh, there are amazing companies who might be able to talk to professional recruiting agencies or so who can help you if you're not sure. But uh, it, you need to change. And it's not very difficult uh, as job description, which will attract a diverse set of individuals. Uh, and yeah, the, a lot of companies uh, I've worked with, they've already changed that. Uh, get rid of bullet points completely, please. Uh, Secondly, a lot of what uh, has happened uh, across uh, is, uh, and I echo what you just say, seeing is believing. Uh, if, if you see individuals in higher positions, in different positions, who look different, uh, and across, you know, not uh, just gender, but, you know, ethnicity or so, uh, then you're more likely to apply. But then if you've got all white male uh, team, uh, you shouldn't hide that either. The, the way to change those things, and I've, say, I've advised a lot of companies on this or so, is look out and go into places like Maiming Games. We, we've got a Facebook page where we encourage people to post jobs. Put it out there. Put on Twitter with words like, we're looking for a diverse candidate. There's nothing wrong with telling people, we are looking for you. Uh, we're just not looking for... Uh, and so, yes, if you are getting an application of just your typical... Uh, stereotypical sort of candidates of who, who usually apply, then there's something wrong in that process. Change that process. Go out of your way to look at different areas where you can look, advertise that job. And in addition to that, and I'll give you a very good example as well, um, which you can look up, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and post uh, if I can. Uh, but DeepMind, uh, which is Alphabet, which is Google's uh, sister org, go and look at their recruitment website. They've got a very, very good diversity pledge or so and so they use the classic sort of way of why diversity matters uh it brings in creativity they they, they work in artificial intelligence machine learning they want diverse candidates because that helps them make better teams it says that on the recruitment page and you should be putting that again not just we're not you know nobody would say yes we are hiring just for the tick box of it or so but actually telling that diversity brings it more innovation, more creativity. We know that's a fact uh, on your web page, and that would attract individuals uh, a lot, lot more rather than just telling them we are looking for diverse individuals. So I'm going to try and post uh, uh, the link to their site as an example. I'm sure there are a lot of other companies and good examples of companies out there uh, who are trying the similar sort of approach of telling people we're looking for diverse stuff. So something's come in about money um I, I suppose like slightly um sort of raising questions about the current moment and, and money being in short supply uh, and the question is you know what are the most effective things that can be done with with little or no money and if i might sort of take a bit of chairs uh, editorializing I, I think this is going to be a bit of a of a problem actually that um you know, there's going to be a lot of talk of there's no money, there's no money, there's no money. But certain parts of the sector have done extremely well um, during uh, lockdown. It, you know, it's it's interesting, for example, that uh, Netflix has just made a series of, of quite substantial investment commitments to Britain. And indeed, if I'd read the media reports correctly, uh, will be, you know, a bit more honest with the government about its tax status. Uh, which, you know, is the sign of a, of a sort of uh, thriving company. So I, I guess I've got two questions. And while Kish is posting the link, is he, are the things that, you know, are most effective with little or no money? Um, and at the same time, do, do you think there is a risk at all that we accept the kind of, oh, there's no money, we should be, you know, less ambitious? 
It's a good question. And I, I'm always a kind of, I think there's a lot that can be done through um, volunteering, through people volunteering their time, through um, organizations kind of leveraging um, as part of their corporate responsibility, you know, time to of their people and their resources in different ways, whether that's giving um, organizations um, free venue space, whether that's um, giving your team members volunteer days they can go out and support um, community organizations or work with entrepreneurs or creatives in different ways, um, whether that is kind of promoting organizations, all this, there's all this stuff that can be done, right? And um, and I, I have to say that, you know, as an organization, we're often inundated with offers of pro bono support considering um, the climate we're in at the moment. And that's all well and good. Um, but if I can just kind of be a bit more controversial here, there's only a limited amount that can achieve there is only a limited amount of pro bono time and resource that resource that can be given if we want to um, achieve the change that we want to see. Because nothing is free, you know. If we are if we are leveraging free people, for example, that's taking them away from working in the business, which affects the bottom line. So only a limited amount of time can be spent. If we're talking about free space that can't be ongoing because we need to think about rent and you know there's only so much that can be achieved and if we really really want to see that we need to be paying people's salaries the number of individuals consultants organizations that are asked to do things for free is a point of sheer frustration in our industry if someone else sends me an email saying they want to pick my brain over something I might shoot them through my laptop no, if you want, if you're genuinely interested, especially if you're a large company, you need to put your money where your mouth is. If you are a small organization that wants to set up a mentoring scheme, if you're a social enterprise or a nonprofit, I have all the time in the world for you. But you should not have to um, not be able to achieve sustainability because organizations are exploiting you. And these same organizations that will exploit you will write a press release about how brilliantly it's been working with you and essentially leverage you for free PR without actually contributing to your organization. So for me, it's this piece of, yes, we can go so far, but if we are serious, government needs to be committing to um, pots of funding that provide um, you know, non-equity, non-dilutive grants to um, creative organizations, uh, community organizations that do fantastic work. They need to be looking into um, forcing companies to commit, I don't know if it's a diversity pledge or whatever it is, but making them really, really take this seriously because there's too much exploitation, there's too many short-term initiatives that go nowhere, but that look really, really good in impact reporting. There's far too much of that. So money, 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 and I'm not afraid to say it anymore. I mean, <laughs> we, as part of the APPG work, I, I can't talk about who said it because we, we have these uh, Chatham House uh, rule meetings. But uh, one of the best points, the most you know, kind of impactful points I've heard was the idea of why isn't diversity your core business? You know, if if your core business is you know making sure your marketing staff are paid because marketing is crucial to maybe how your your theatre functions then you you know you wouldn't consider saying well the marketers have to work for free you know because they're core business and if organizations are serious i think there is something of taking a commitment to transforming the organization as core business and giving it the same status as you know the hr department or you know the ceo's remuneration or or, or whatever um yeah. is, is there anything you want to add in the yeah I, I I'm just going to because uh, you are amazingly and well qualified to talk about money. I'll add other bit, which is equally important to a lot of the companies, uh, which is recognition. So mm -hmm. awards, award ceremonies and, you know, like your, your BAFTAs or Oscars or so, they should need to start. And I think uh, I'm pretty sad uh, BAFTA has, uh, but you need to look at not just giving the best pictures or best video games, et cetera, but the people who made it, the diverse teams, that should be a big factor. And so that, and same with the government as well, recognizing the structures of teams uh, across or so, rather than the end product of it or so, or as the success, uh, I think that, that that needs to come. That's already happening in a lot of uh, areas or so, uh, but let's hope more and more start bringing in uh, fair assessment, obviously. You don't want to 
make it like a tick box exercise just to get awards by hiring people uh, for the sake of it. But that that needs to happen, I think. I, I'm going to maybe bring together a couple of points. Martin Smith has has raised this issue about uh, you know the the companies that have done you know maybe okay or have prospered during the pandemic aren't UK domiciled ones. And, and you know I mentioned Netflix and he's mentioned Universal Music. Uh, but there's also a, a question about, uh, I guess, the kind of the business structure of the industry, you know, particularly the, the nature of micro uh, and, and you know, small and medium uh, enterprises versus sectors like, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, Barclays, which is you know multinational, a uh, very large organisation, uh, which uh, you know gives various kind of advantages when they're thinking about an organisational strategy. And, and I guess the question is. How could we think about um, this issue of scale? You know, is a solution to these two points the idea that Britain should be, you know, seeking to kind of build um, a really big, you know, kind of multinational uh, set of creative organisations, or actually um, are there real advantages to being uh, small and, and medium sized? Um, I, Izzy, do you want to go first on that? I think um, a healthy ecosystem um, is one in which there are players of all shapes, sizes, colours um, in it. And um, I think that when it comes to, okay, when it comes to organisations that support um, the creative sector, the digital sector, for example, um, I find that funding often gets concentrated in organisations that have yes a proven track record you know they have the infrastructure um they have um, relationships um within government or within these funding institutions and are able to therefore kind of um uh, you know get the kind of funding that they need and deliver the kind of work that they do and that makes sense to an extent but i think what happens a little bit less is particularly for non-profits social enterprises kind of smes micro smes um there is less infrastructure that it's put in place to build capacity so those organizations can kind of grow and um, service those kind of kinds of government bids and contracts and really kind of grow that way and so I see a kind of combination of things happening and there's one thing that I've been um, I've been trying to do um, for a few months now and I feel like it's starting to happen bringing together a network of organizations who work in the um, diverse digital tech space to so look into how we can collectively share knowledge, how we can act um, as a collective voice, um, how we can leverage our influence, how we can kind of shape an agenda together because we realise if we're all applying for the same pots of funding and we're all applying with quite similar offers, there is strength in collaboration and there's maybe not enough of that at the moment so we're looking into what that looks like but that's just one kind of set of organizations in one kind of space in the ecosystem more broadly speaking i think especially now more work going into helping small organizations build the kinds of capacity um and and um jointly bid so they can actually collectively have as much capacity as some of the larger organizations is what we need to see so it's that balance and i think it's only with that balance that we're going to see um, support on that scale we, we, we need. And we keep talking about talent, early stage talent and the support that's out there for them. Yes, there aren't enough apprenticeships. Yes, there aren't enough work experience opportunities. But you know what we can do? We can provide training programmes that offer micro placements to these institutions where they are paid London living wage by some kind of government grant fund and they are put into these SMEs, they are put into these organisations so they can support for short periods of time get that experience in their CV and become a lot more employable. So there are micro opportunities that we can be taking advantage of, but we need to build the infrastructure in order to create that so we can build the pipeline as well. And, and you, you made me reflect on um, a lot of work that I've uh, done, done with various um, organisations and, and, and I'm trying to think how, how best to describe it, you know, almost a kind of a cliff edge where, you know, you go from a startup um, that's innovative, interesting, is doing new things, to a point where all of a sudden you need, you know, a really serious bit of HR. Uh, you know, there's a whole kind of load of things that you know you, you had no idea about in terms of, of formal uh, kind of um, demands on on both your your sort of time and, and, and your skills as a business. 
And I mean, that that's not unique to the creative industries. You know, that's true of, of almost every small business as it scales up. But it, it is maybe kind of, um, you know, frustrating that creative organizations have not been perhaps as, you know, kind of innovative and as, you know, forward thinking. The, the example you gave there, it sounds a bit bland, doesn't it, to say you could have, you know, a three week micro placement with a HR department, but actually, you know, that could be transformative um, for some business, um, particularly in, in terms of, of scale. Um, Kish, in, in, in terms of, I mean, you know, games is funny because the landscape is so diverse in terms of, you know, development, publishing, you know, you, you mentioned on the panel, the uh, it's, it's not, a, you know, an exact split, but, you know, the idea of the business side and, and then the creative side. And I guess is game something where um, we we might be more relaxed actually about the problem of scale that you know in some ways games has kind of uh, has sorted this how you go from uh, being you know small interesting innovative maybe just a programmer on on your own to something that is you know kind of market leading and and global. Um. Oh, yeah. You sort of summarized it almost pretty well, so I was just trying oh, to see how, how more. But the video games is is as an industry is that uh, maybe a bit more uh, landscape. Majority of the big you talk about the bigger companies or so are either U.S., Japan, uh, possibly. I can only think of one which is uh, based in France, Ubisoft. Uh, so they tend to become, so if you reach a certain size or so, you end up uh, getting acquired and become a studio which reports to a bigger organization, which is usually out of Britain. We've got some amazing uh, industries who've been around uh, from the beginning of the industry who've actually well established now as well. I, I, I could, I, I'll avoid listing the names because I know I'm going to forget some amazing individuals on that. But uh, what you just said as well, the industry is exactly that, like music industry or f uh, film or whatever, uh, where there is one individual sitting in the bedroom who can then write or create his sort of uh, empire from there as well. And that's um, that's fantastic. But I don't think there's anything really you can map out right now. It's just too small an industry. I, I think it's, uh, is it six, 16 thousand i think uh, don't quote me on that uh, who work in the video games industry which is minuscule as such but the revenue generates it's crazy uh, from from that sort of uh, number of individuals in the industry so i think again going back to data so it's very difficult to uh, make any bold statements because we just don't have enough data to study this or be able to mention uh, any patterns of yeah, I mean, as an academic who studies yeah. this stuff, people expect me to say we need more data, but, you know, we really do need more data. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's a major issue in the area. I, I'm conscious we've, we've got sort of three or four minutes yeah. uh, on the panel, and I wonder, just to kind of wrap up, is, is there anything um, that you, you'd like to add? Maybe, maybe I'll stay with you, Kish. Um, is there anything, yeah. you know, you think I, we haven't covered or, or anything yeah. you want to add? I just want to add a bit more, and because it's a lot, uh, closer to my heart as well, what Izzy had mentioned uh, about uh, especially African countries or any developing countries, and I'll, I'll probably actually make, put it a bit more bluntly. Uh, unfortunately, when you're looking for investment based out there, and again, I'm on advisory board for uh, certain conferences in South Africa and then helping out uh, individuals in Kenya. I was born in Kenya, so again, can relate to a lot of this. But the fact is you will inherit uh, the stereotype of that government and disciplines that working. So if there's corruption in certain countries in Africa, your investor will look at you as exactly that. So I think what you said, it's spot on that, you know, they'll just assume if we give money for development on southern I'll go into your pocket or so. Uh, and it's not, I, mean, I, I certainly feel it's not an investor's fault because that's the best data they have from that area. So it's wrong. It shouldn't be stereotyping blanket on things. But I, I think that's an area where suddenly we need a lot more, especially individuals that, you know, that's a fact. Then address that and tell them and be transparent. Show them exactly the accountabilities and the processes you've 
got in place where that money is going to be used on that. So I just I just wanted to add a bit more on that, that uh, I think a lot of this, especially in the emerging markets, but you get that from indie developers as well, is exact same issue in Britain. If you're an indie developer, again, trusting an indie developer sitting in their bedroom, uh, I'm, I'm going to use this, it sounds horrible, but again, there are so many developers in their parents' house, living, working from their bedroom. And an investor, again, again, you know, they will just look at like, that's a high risk. So ch changing that sort of things, addressing that, and nothing wrong with that, saying this is exactly how we're going to make use of the money. And this is the processes, these are the ring fences we have added. Uh, so working on that for any developer would be fantastic. Any um, concluding comments, Izzy? Just um, a bit of a, um, a bit of a kind of promo, but we talked a lot about professionals kind of giving their time um, to supporting founders, entrepreneurs. We run a fellowship program at Found Vine where we get mid to late um, career professionals to commit to 12 months of giving their time in different ways as speakers, as mentors, as judges for programs. And we'd like delighted to have um, any of you who are listening um, or my fellow kind of panelists join us as well, because there's so much work we need to do um, and so many amazing entrepreneurs in our network that can benefit from it. So I'll leave it in the chat and feel free to have a look at that. Great. Um, if we are doing shameless plugs, uh, if people are interested in, I guess, some of the, uh, the pessimism uh, that I started with, uh, a lot of that I take from a book um, that I've written with uh, Orion Brook and Mark Taylor called Culture is Bad for You. Um, and yeah, I'll, um, I'll put a link um, to, uh, to, to where you can, you can pick that up from Manchester University Press and into the chat shortly as well. Um, but otherwise, I, I think that, that's about it. From us, they, they said uh, 23 was the, uh, the cutoff point. So uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you all. Bye.